Hey guys, Mike here from Fortinet Guru. In today's video, we're basically going to drill down top to bottom, left to right, all the things that are FortiGate. Uh, what I mean when I say that is if you are new to FortiGates or new to Fortinet in general, and someone were to drop a FortiGate on your lap and say, here you go, learn, have fun, figure it out, this video will be very useful to you. Basically, we're going to drill down through all the menus on the uh, FortiOS 724 and explain what all of it means, why it's useful, and of course the benefits that having a, you know, a, a next-gen firewall available to you is beneficial. So one of the main things is obviously FortiGates are what we call next-gen firewalls. That means they're able to see throughout the entire network stack. That means not only can you tell source, destination, and service, important protocol, but you're also able to tell things like what type of applications are actually on my network. Now that's obviously beneficial because modern day criminals are going to utilize normal ports, normal services to do other things with. You can make applications pretty much right on whatever port you wish. So having visibility into what's actually on your network is critical to make sure your life is easier. So right now let's get started. So this is the dashboard of my house FortiGate. This is an overly complex environment, but it, you know, it's in use. So you can actually see some useful data. This is actually the second time I've recorded this video because I realized that using a FortiGate that is not connected in any way does not do a very good job of explaining all the things because you can't really see anything. Anyways, so when you first log into your FortiGate, you're going to end up on the status dashboard. This is useful because obviously it'll give you system information about your device. You're able to see the serial number, the host name of said device, and of course the firmware that you are running. This particular FortiGate is a FortiGate ADE PoE and it's running 40 OS 724. It tells you the mode it's running in because you have NAT mode, transparent mode, etc. You can obviously run vWires as well, which is going to hang out in this particular mode anyways. I have the application widget that I have added to this particular device and it lets you know what type of traffic is on my network currently. Of course, it shows the sessions that are currently going through the box. Like I said, my network's not that large, so it's, it's relatively low on a session count. I have added interface bandwidth widgets to my device. I'm able to see my primary link, which is my AT&T fiber, the amount of bandwidth I have going through that, as well as uh, my backup cable modem provider that basically just, you know, when stuff hits the fan, it is what it is. And then of course you have your CPU widget and your memory widget. Just like your task manager on your computer, this gives you the ability to see how your box is doing. You know, I'm currently cruising it between one and 10% utilization. And that's with my kids downstairs streaming Netflix and doing stuff. Um, have a few hundred devices across all my networks. So, you know. And then of course, memory utilization, just like the task manager on a computer as well, you're able to see how much of the box you're currently consuming. Users and devices, this is where you'll see your actual device inventory. As you can see, there's 95 current devices on my network, and if you drill down, you're able to see the types of them. So I have a lot of Amazon Echo Dots. I know I'm a security person, but I like the convenience. A lot of Apple products, a whole bunch of uh, computers and smart home stuff. Obviously, I have multiple FortiGates just hanging out on my network doing whatever. HP switches. Where would we be without Xboxes? So I have my Series X and my Xbox One on here, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can see, very useful data, right? You're able to see the type of devices, the address of said devices. Of course, you're able to see the subnet. And if you wanted to, you could even add interfaces and whatnot to see what type of, uh, what interface your VLAN your stuff's hanging off of, as well as what the FortiGate's able to query from it. So you're able to pull software details, device family details, etc. All very cool stuff. FortiClient, firewall users, and quarantine. These things are visible if you have FortiClient on your environment. It'll tell you whenever you have devices that are actually connected up. Um, FortiClient is very useful. Everything in the FortiNet ecosystem can tie into a FortiGate and make use of it. Firewall users, obviously I don't have any, but if I was SSL VPN in, you would see my connection right here, etc. If I was running FortiNet single sign-on as well, you'd see the users on this environment. The security page, this is where it's going to tell you the things that it thinks are security risk. So basically, 
Um, I don't have any host that it considers compromised based on the uh, machine learning or you know the heuristics that a FortiGate can do. But it does see a fair number of threats. As you can see, failed connections and blocked connections are the only two of real consequence. The proxy HTTP are just my SSL VPN connections going out to the world. You can see that it does a host scan against it, and then you can, you can dig down and, and see more about that. The network dashboard is exactly as you expect. It'll show you things relating to your network, whether that be connected routes, your static routes or default routes, any of your um, dynamically learned routes if you were running BGP, OSPF, RIP, etc. Of course, you can see your DHCP servers and the addresses that have been issued out. And then your SD-WAN gives you a really good insight into your SD-WAN environment, you know, how it's running, the number of sessions on each link, amount of bandwidth, etc., and of course the status and the SLA considerations of the devices. As you can see, I'm running roughly green across the board, but basically I have it set to if packet loss is less than 10%, it's considered good. If it's less than 150 milliseconds in latency, it's good. And if it's less than 30 milliseconds jitter, which is actually kind of relaxed, if you will, you would probably want that lower for most folks. The FortiView dashboards do exactly what you expect them to do, right? They show the top sources, destinations, the applications, etc. So on this particular box, you can see that I'm, I've got a device that is sending syslog. I have Plex TV running on my network because I have a hosted Plex server. You can see that Spotify is on my environment. Um, you can drill down in all these. It basically gives you a really good job and view of what your stuff is going to or talking to. A whole bunch of Amazon stuff. I got a whole bunch of Amazon stuff because obviously I run Echo Dots everywhere and I'm pretty much letting it cruise. So each one of these will provide insight into your network and give you that wonderful visibility that you have. So this is just a, a raw application list. You can see I run Slack, I run Signal, I run AnyDesk. This is pretty much all from my main computer too, with the exception of the TV downstairs. The policies page does exactly what you expect it to. It gives you a view of the policies that traffic is currently being able to traverse. And then your sessions gives you kind of a drill down of the sessions that are active on your box. Pretty straightforward and simple. Networking, this is where you actually make configuration changes to your device. Within the interfaces page, you're able to see your, your hardware switches, your software switches, your physical interfaces, uh, any V-wires that you created, any zones that you would use for grouping of said interfaces, etc. So as you can see here, I have an SD-WAN zone called outside that has my two externally facing interfaces. And then of course I have IPsec tunnels tied to my fiber line because that's what I care about. My cable line is not a high quality line. You can see the VLANs that I have hanging off of my internal hardware switch. These guys currently trunk through my HP switches. I do not have four to switch yet, but I'm about to overhaul my network and that'll be a whole nother video in itself that you guys will enjoy. DNS, this is what the FortiGate itself uses for DNS. As you notice, you can use FortiGuard servers or you can define your own. Just know that if you define your own, you're most likely going to have to switch to regular DNS because most other services aren't using TLS or HTTPS yet. DNS servers, this is basically if your FortiGate was running a DNS server itself, you could run a rudimentary DNS server here and provide some lookups specific to your local domain if you don't already have a domain controller or any central stuff like that. IPAM, so I don't currently have this enabled or running, but Fortinet brought in the ability to run IPAM on their devices. For those of you that don't know, IPAM is basically a way of keeping up with your network addressing, what devices are currently utilized, or more so what IP space is currently utilized, what it's for. It's basically documentation and, and the ability to keep up with what's what, what subnets are in use, and how they can be of use to you. Local out routing, this is basically how you control what these services use from a interface standpoint. So within the CLI, you're able to usually define, you know, if you're sending logs to Forda Analyzer, send it from this interface. This is just an easier way in the GUI to do so. Forda extenders, these are wireless extenders that basically, once you connect them to a FortiGate, it gives you the ability to add LTE to your device. Awesome for failover. Uh, in some environments, it's it's actually a pretty good use for um, normal traffic, especially if it's all that they have, right? 
SD-WAN, this is where you actually configure your SD-WAN. So as you can see here, my outside zone has my two member interfaces. I have the rules defined that say, you know, all these traffic sources will use this. You know, my kids always use the fiber. The IoT and the Pruitt LAN can fill over and the, the qualifications to do so. And then, of course, this is my health check where I'm basically running steady SLA checks against my interfaces to make sure they're in line. SD-WAN provides a really big use case. So SD-WAN on Fortinet, the best way that I've learned to explain it is, and this is really the case for anything, but if you have multiple paths to a specific destination, SD-WAN makes sense. Use it, let it ride. You have multiple internet connections, obviously that's multiple paths to the internet. Use SD-WAN to do automatic failover, load balancing, or quality of line checks. That way you can use the line that's gonna be the healthiest. Just makes sense, right? Next up is the static route page. Um, static routes, is, this is where you define all your static routes and what all is in use currently for your interfaces. I have an internet static route and then of course I have the ones necessary for one of my businesses. Policy routes, these are if you wanted to force specific traffic over specific links. SD-WAN is kind of taken over for that so it's not really that big of a deal now. RIP, OSPF, and BGP, these are dynamic routing protocols. You use these for the FortiGate to be able to dynamically learn routes from other devices and or sources. Uh, BGP is used mostly for the internet. OSPF is usually used for internal stuff, though uh, BGP can be used for internals as well. RIP, I very rarely see in the wild. Now in 724, they gave you the ability to add routing objects within the GUI before you had to do everything in the CLI. So Fortinet has done a very good job of making it to where life isn't so miserable when trying to configure more advanced items. So if you're trying to do prefix lists or route maps, which is basically how you define what routes you wish to be shared across what protocols, you can now do that within here. Multicast routing, uh, things like Sonos and various other anycast type TV services, etc. Et Use multicast, and this is basically where you can configure how multicast would work on your network. And then you have diagnostics. This is where you go when stuff is not working. Previously, you had to do all of your debug flows within the CLI. They obviously brought this to the FortiGate GUI, which is wonderful because it makes it so much more presentable for the end user. And then, of course, you can run packet captures so you can make sure that your traffic is doing exactly as you intend. Policy and object section, this is where you define your firewall policies. You know, your source, your destination, what's allowed to go where. So as you see here, inside the out, you can set, you know, source traffic to these destinations over this schedule, allow, and then apply your layer seven capabilities to it. Multicast policies, uh, this touches base on what interfaces allow multicast to traverse across them. Your local end policies, this is where you lock down your box. So for instance, if you have external administration enabled on your firewall, this enables you to basically say, okay, we're gonna allow HTTPS into the WAN, but only from these sources. Just like a standard firewall policy, it's basically how the device knows whether or not to listen for specific traffic. IPv4, this is your DOS policy. This is where you go if you want to configure policies that'll help mitigate denial of service attacks against you, your device or to make sure that your endpoints aren't being a member of an attack going out. Addresses are pretty simple. These are address objects. You see this on a sonic wall, FortiGate, ASA, PAN. It's usually the same. The Internet Service Database. This is a dynamically updated database straight from FortiGuard. It includes network services and internet services. Why is this useful? Well, this is useful because now you don't have to keep up with all 917,000 possible you know, destinations or whatever for each one of these, especially if it's a cloud-based service. Obviously, updating all the subnets would be a nightmare. So this just gives you the ability to, to run through and make sure that you can use these as destinations instead of specific subnets. Services are your firewall service categories. These are like you know SSH. Ports and protocols is a good way to look at this. Schedules, you can build schedules around your firewall that says the traffic can only traverse at certain times. For instance, I have a kid's schedule that's not currently referenced, 
but I wanted to make it to where it was only usable from 8 a.m. until about 7 p.m. You know, after that, my kids don't need the internet. It is what it is. They're supposed to be asleep. Virtual IPs, this is where you do destination ads. IP pools, this is how you make traffic look like certain things going out to the internet. So this is like for SourceNet. Protocol options, obviously, this is how the FortiGate handles specific protocols, what type of comforts it can do, etc. Traffic shaping, I don't use traffic shaping as much as I probably care to admit. Um, because mainly most of the time it doesn't really do a whole lot except drop packets, right? I just don't like it. Virtual servers, these are basically special virtual IPs that give you the ability to have a single external IP and or translated IP. It doesn't have to be external, but it gives you the ability to load balance multiple real servers behind that, which is awesome. And then of course you can use health checks against those servers. The security profile section, this is where you configure your layer seven visibility. You know, I have my AV profile that's gonna block, it's gonna scan and block, you know, all the various antivirus, all the various viruses that might be trying to get on the network. You have your web filter. This is where you say, I wanna monitor or allow or block or authenticate against various categories. So if you wanted to block porn or, or block extremist websites or something like that, you'd use your web filter or your DNS filter. Uh, basically gives you the ability to see you know where folks are going on your network really good visibility application control this is the heavy hitter obviously as a next gen firewall this is going to pay dividends what traffic is on my network as you can see here i am currently running a monitor mode for security guy i actually run pretty relaxed um so i can see what's actually on my network and then i can make policies to block those. IPS, this is intrusion prevention. Fortinet has this built in. Previously, you saw a lot of folks running like tipping points or something like that, which I would still recommend having multiple layers of defense. But the FortiGate does have that capability, which is basically making it your one-stop shop. You can configure file filters for file types. You know, if you see files going out to the internet in a specific way, obviously you could limit them. Uh, same thing with email filters. This is a really rudimentary capability of, of locking down email. With most things being in the cloud, you don't really see this used as much. VoIP. If you are configuring VoIP on your FortiGate, you are in trouble. Never, ever use these. I have a video titled specifically how to fix VoIP issues, and it pretty much involves removing any type of inspection from the FortiGate when it comes to voice traffic. It just is what it is. SSL slash SSH inspection. This is how you break the packet and kind of man in the middle, all encrypted traffic. You have to remember, right? 80% of web traffic is encrypted in some form now, including malicious traffic. So in order to actually see malicious traffic and inspect it and be able to do security functions on it, you kind of need to man in the middle of that traffic. So if you can't see it, you don't know it's there. But, um, but yeah, and this gives you the ability to do, you know, custom deep inspection. This is the certificate that gets presented. These are the ports and protocols in which it's going to actually look. And these are guys that you usually want to exempt. Always exempt finance and health sites because it's, if this is for a work business type function, you know, that you break that traffic apart and you see their details and then your your logging system gets compromised next thing you know you have HIPAA issues and and FISMA issues re with relation to finance and banking just save yourself the heartache you can build custom application signatures so if you have custom one-off applications you have the ability to really tear it apart and do some cool things here and then of course the same thing with IPS signatures you can build your own Web writing overrides and web profile overrides. This is how you basically make websites show up based on what you view them as. So just because a website is viewed by FortiGuard as porn, it might just be sex ed, right? So you could actually change the category and make it allowed. The VPN panel is where you do everything related to virtual private networking. This is you know your IPsec tunnels, whether they be site to site, or whether they are dial-up tunnels. You know, you have the ability to do the OC VPN, which is that overlay controller. Basically does all the mesh stuff for you. Really cool stuff. Your actual IPsec tunnels, how you configure them for site-to-sites, etc. 
The FortiGate does give you a really groovy wizard, but if you're OCD like me, you won't use this because the wizard creates a whole bunch of address objects, routes, and policies, and I like to be very specific on my stuff. SSL VPN gives you the ability to create SSL VPN access to your network. This is all remote access type stuff, etc. So that you could use FortiClient to dial into your network when you're abroad. And then of course you can configure bookmarks and realms and specific configurations just for your end users. And then of course if you were to use it you could actually see the VPN location map which would tell you where all the remote users or sites are coming from. As you can see the only one that we see here is my OSISO one for Office of the CISO and you can see that it's local to me. User and authentication, this is where you configure your users, if, whether they be local, whether the groups be remote or Azure oriented. You can do specific guest management so you can create guest users that only work for certain periods of time before they expire. What's really groovy about a Fortinet is you don't have to have a Fortinet authenticator to do a lot of remote authentication. You can use the FortiGate for SAML, you can use it for LDAP, you can use it for RADIUS. So if you have an on-prem Active Directory, you can tie your FortiGate into it and then use Active Directory credentials for things like SSL VPN or dial-up VPN access. Very cool stuff. Um, of course, you can use single sign-on, which gives you the ability to do all kinds of things. Um, this is usually SAML tie-in with like Azure or G Suite. It's much easier to use on Azure. And then this is your authentication settings for, for miscellaneous stuff. The FortiGates out of the box come with two Forti tokens. My particular one, I use Azure, therefore I don't use the built-in ones, but you could use this for multi-factor using the Forti token mobile app on your phone. Very cool stuff. It's one of those, like, you know, what the drug dealers do, they let you have a hit, get you hooked, and then next thing you know, you're buying a whole bunch more tokens for your environment. Next up, we have our Wi-Fi and switch controller. This is where you're gonna live if you're managing access points or switches on the uh, device. As you can see, I don't have any APs on this particular one, but you would see the access point here, whether it's online, offline, authorized, deauthorized, etc. The SSIDs that are associated with said AP, as well as channels, clients, OS versions, etc. If you run the full Fortinet stack, you can even see what interface is connected by, as well as you know what port, which is awesome. It really makes troubleshooting things really easy. And then of course you could see Wi-Fi clients, the SSIDs. If you built out a map, you could actually see maps of your APs placement in your environment. So if you had like a floor plan, etc., which makes the FortiGate even more so a one-stop shop for for your troubleshooting capabilities. AP profiles, that's just where you create your profile for your AP so that you can do it at scale. So if you had a whole bunch of 221Es, you could create an AP profile called 221E default or something. And then you can set your parameters based on your environment. Like maybe you have an environment that doesn't have a whole lot of overhead. So you can use 80 megahertz uh, channel width and actually get more speed, etc. FortiLink is the trunk interface of the FortiGate for FortiSwitch management. This is where all your FortiGates or this is where all your FortiSwitches will live. Pretty good stuff. It's useful. Um, manage FortiSwitches. This is where you actually be able to see your FortiSwitches. So if you had a bunch of FortiSwitches being managed, you could see their name. You could group them so that you could manage them as a group. And of course, their status, their model, their firmware version, etc. The more you dive into this, the more Forta things you bring into your environment, the more visibility and drill down capability you'll have. You can do cable test from the Forta switch and actually see if a cable that you're running is bad or good, which is awesome. Um, they gave you the ability to see Forta switch clients. <clears throat> so this will be endpoints or devices that are connected via the Forta switch. Then of course the VLANs that are configured on it. Um, this is just another way of looking at the network interfaces page because you could create them there as well. You could actually see four to switch ports. You would see a long list of ports, you know, switch number one, two, three, eight, five, seven, blah, blah, blah. Ports one through eight, you could see their VLANs and all that. Obviously, since this FortiGate's not managing a switch, it's kind of blah. And then, of course, you could do basic NAC or network access control policies. System settings, this is where you actually see your administrators, the admin profiles, and then what Fortinet calls the fabric. 
Fabric management is just basically management of the switches and everything that would be tied into the FortiGate. The settings is where you define the FortiGate specific settings, like what ports do you listen to, etc. HA, if this was an HA cluster box, then you would have, you know, active, active, or active, passive, and you would have a primary and a secondary box. SNMP, this is how you configure things to, you know, basically be able to be queried and usable. So we run this, that way, you know, our monitoring software can keep up in my FortiGate and go, okay, the CPU is high. We need to troubleshoot that. Replacement messages, this is where you go if you want to edit any of the pages within the box. So for instance, if you have web filtering turned on and you're blocking specific categories, you can basically make your page look the way you want it to. Instead of just the basic, you know, this is our FortiGate block page. You can brand this to your company and it's really, really nice. Really, really convenient. Same thing with application and URL blockings, etc. FortiGuard, this is how you see your entitlement. As you can tell, this box is expired as hell. It is what it is. Um, and then, you know, how much bandwidth or, or utilization it's used over the last 24 hours to send or receive logs or data. Feature visibility. Fortinet turns a lot of stuff off in the GUI by default to keep you from being overrun. A lot of stuff that's visible on my FortiGate will not be visible on your FortiGate until you, you know, dive in here. So this is where you turn it all on. A lot of cool things. As you can see, I don't run IPv6, so I leave that off. I don't run DLP, so I leave it off, etc. Certificates. This is where your certificates that exist on the box are done. Let's Encrypt is built in on 7.0 and newer, so you don't have to pay for certificates anymore to publicly host your VPN, etc. All you got to do is create an FQDN or use Dynamic DNS and then let it ride. Security Fabric, this is where you basically drill down on your environment. You're able to look at what we call a physical topology which gives you visibility into how things are physically cabled and what type of traffic may or may not be visible on it. Um, you don't see as much on this one because obviously I don't run the full Fortinet stack. I'm just running the Fortis switch. But you can see here, you can see my internet link and then the various devices that are on my network. When you look at the logical layout, that's where you start seeing things like VLANs and such like that. It's a little bit more drawn out even without the Fortis switch. Um, obviously you see less traffic than you would normally because you know I don't have the full stack but you can at least see VLANs like you know on my LAN I have 24 devices my kids I have three devices my IOT I have another 38 etc and it kind of shows the flow logically of how it comes in and out security rating this is just a big old ugly sales piece for Fortinet in my opinion every single thing that they push through here is basically to get you to buy more Forta things to meet their needs. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you don't have log capacity. To pass this, you gotta buy logs. You know, you don't have FortiGuard filtering. You gotta have EMS to do this. You know, all that fun stuff. Yes, it's good. You know, if you have the full Fortinet stack, it's gonna provide you a lot of quality visibility and capability. But to say that you need all of this certain stuff to be PCI compliant, it's kinda gnarly. It's like, uh, I don't need Internet of Things vulnerability capabilities to be PCI compliant. This is just a technical tool that maps to this specific control that you could use something else for. I mean, obviously, they're a company. They're in here to make money, so it is what it is. Automation. These are automation stitches. So you can build in automatic capabilities to the, to the device. So what I mean by that is if a failover occurs, you can make it send an email to your system. Uh, whether that be in users directly or you could have it email your ticket system and use APIs to enter, you know, details. Automation stitches are very, very powerful. You can create different triggers, actions to take based on those triggers. And from there, you can pretty much streamline a lot of your management capabilities, which, I mean, you guys know. In business, anytime you can automate things and make it more efficient, it's going to pay dividends for you, especially if it enables you to scale better. It lets you hit the ground running and do more for your business. Just makes sense to do. So, um, fabric connectors, that's where you're looking at things like your Forta Manager, your Forta Analyzer, your Forta Gate Cloud, 
if you're running Forta client EMS, this is how you tie it in, right? So that your Forta gate can know where your ZTNA tags are for your endpoints and let them in based on that stuff. Um, Forta Sandbox <clears throat> and various other third-party supported connectors are all built in here as well. These are all the Forta things, but you also have the ability to do uh, external connectors, which is what this is. So if you did an external connector, you could tie this into software-defined networking or Azure Cloud or, or anything like that. A lot of cool stuff. I have a lot of clients that use uh, third-party threat feeds, and they just tie them in. It's awesome stuff. Asset identity. This is basically how you drill down and see the assets, and you know you can rate them or give them various um, details, right? Logging and reporting. This is where the fun happens. All of this capability, if you have a box that's pushing any kind of bandwidth, is useless unless you actually have the ability to run reports and do things. So if you don't have a Forta Analyzer or you don't have FortiGate Cloud, you're not going to have the ability to run reports unless you have a local storage box, right? Which I don't really like running reports locally, it just is what it is. But it's nice to be able to say, okay, I got all of this capability. Let me run a report and see what type of malicious traffic I have. And this basically lets you run down and look at things and, and use um, capabilities of the box to make educated decisions on your network. And then, of course, you have the ability to actually log a multitude of things. Like my local log, this is a ADE, so it does not have onboard storage. So the only thing I have here is memory. But you can configure third-party logging and send it to like a syslog server. So, yeah. So that was about 30 minutes of me hauling ass through a FortiGate to give you a drill down of what each page on the FortiGate is useful for. Um, if you are new to FortiNet hardware, don't let the wild number of options that are available to you basically melt you down. There's about a thousand different types of FortiGate, 40F, 41F. The 40F for GLTE, the 60F, the 61F, the 60F POE. I mean, there's all kinds of options, if you will. And one of the first things that I see folks do is they melt down because they're like, which one's the one I need? Well, these videos are going to help basically explain use cases for each type of FortiGate and how much you actually need this, that, and the other. Um, anytime you're running a FortiGate, I do recommend running Forti switches and Forti APs just for the added visibility to the environment. Um, unless you're just like an uber nerd and you just really want your extreme switches or your HP switches or whatever. The only reason why I still have an HP switch is because I bought it long before I got into Fortinet and it still runs and it's gigabit switch. So, But yeah, that is the top level going through a FortiGate ADE. Doesn't really matter what model you have. 40 OS is 40 OS. You do get some new stuff on various versions of FortiGates. Like some of them have switch fabric, which means they can run hardware switches, which are uh, accelerated by hardware versus just using a CPU. Uh, the main difference on devices is the fact that you have different port densities, more throughput capability, etc. So you know. The world is your oyster. You know, whatever your imagination is, you can find a FortiGate to meet it. Um, do me a favor. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to post them below. Uh, if you like the video, do me a solid. Hit the like button. Yeah, thumbs up. If you didn't like it, hit the thumbs down. It helps engagement anyways. And uh, if you haven't already, hit subscribe. I'm about to ramp up some more videos and start doing probably a video a week. Tutorial driven in nature, specifically to make your life easier when it comes to Fortinet. So until next time, um, you guys stay safe.